Shalom, brothers and sisters. Mike here, another Watchman Thinking Out Loud, TOL. Guys, I look forward to the day where we'll be waving palms and singing songs. It's really exciting to see that day fastly approaching. We clearly see the events of Matthew 24, Psalm 83, and many other scriptures coming into focus through all the world events that are taking place in more rapid succession, just like the birth pangs increasing in frequency and intensity. I can't believe we're alive to see all this, guys. It's astonishing. Well, I want to answer the question. I want to do a study on this. Does the menorah encode the timing of the rapture? I believe it's possible that the timing of the rapture and the tribulation may be encoded and or at least at the very least hinted at in the menorah. So hang in there with me on this because it's not going to be a simple two-minute explanation. In fact, I would recommend adjusting the YouTube playback speed to 1.25x to get through this faster so you can be more efficient with your time. I'm also doing this video in vertical format on my cell phone because although the Life Bible app, which I use on my cell phone, it although it's available through the browser on any computer with all my notes and highlights that you're going to see here in the app, um, the app on my cell phone lets me navigate much faster for the deep journey that we're about to embark on and it shows the highlight colors more vividly uh, than on my PC. Uh, by the way, uh, Life Bible is, in my opinion, by far the best Bible app out of all of them, and I highly recommend it to help take your studying from bottle milk to meat and potatoes, you know, solid food, um, especially since it has Strong's Concordance uh, tied into the KJV, uh, which is basically kind of like blue letter Bible kind of built into it, all right? Um, there are some Hebrew words that are not, you know, the concordance is not uh, available for. The Blue Letter Bible is definitely more comprehensive, uh, but it's still very, very good, and I would highly recommend it. All right, so let's do this. Now, remember, um, Proverbs 25, 2, that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and to search out a matter is the glory of kings. God conceals he hides many things in his word, and these things are not always easy or trivial to seek out and understand. I find that for me, in my personal walk with God, the Holy Spirit will teach me and guide me into truth, and it often involves a journey of revelation through the scriptures, running to and fro, so to speak, right, through the scriptures. And that's where having the technology, right, with like a Life Bible app to run to and fro very quickly um, becomes very, very useful. Um, also remember that agriculture is a central theme to the Bible that must be understood. Okay, it's fundamental. God designed in his creation of, of the earth, he designed the earth's agricultural system and its repeating cycles to give us a deeper understanding of his plans for mankind and the timing of events and their outcomes. The seven feasts of the Lord are surrounding agriculture. Okay, um, so agriculture, especially that of Israel and God's plans for man are inexorably linked. You need to understand that fact. It is a fact. Now let's take a close look at the menorah and get an understanding of its design and features and see what God is trying to convey through it, where it takes us through scripture. And let's take a look at how it informs us of the timing of the rapture and the start of the tribulation. Now, instructions, if we go to the Bible, instructions for the, if I go to uh, Exodus here, instructions for the design of the menorah are listed in Exodus 25 and then mirrored again later in Exodus 37. So the real interesting thing about this, there's the lampstand right there, is that, you know, we, first we've all seen many different menorah designs and sadly many of them that we see today don't conform to the original design pattern that God gave, okay? And if I just go to my photos, or right here is fine. This menorah, the one you see pictured here, this is a very, very close representation to the original menorah and it follows the instructions that God gives in both Exodus 25 and Exodus 37, repeated in Exodus 37. Uh, very accurately, okay? Um, so we need we need to look at this and understand what are the features of it, all right? And 
when we look at Exodus 25, we see here that first off, it's got to be made of pure gold. Okay. Um, it's, it's, the whole thing has to be hammered out. It has to be beaten. Okay. So it, we're in the NIV. If we go over to the KJV, we can see here that it's made of pure gold and it's beaten work. And we can see that word right there, hammered work, finely decorated, uh, single piece. Okay. Single piece, one piece. All right. This is important. Okay. There's the, uh, the shaft there. Okay. The loin. Okay. Got to gird those loins. There's the loin, the shaft, the, the main shaft. And let's go back over to the NIV. But we can see here that we have all these almond flowers, okay? Cups shaped like almond flowers, buds. We have six branches, okay? Extending from the sides of the lampstand, okay? Again, almond flowers, buds, and blossoms, okay? Now, and again, hammered out of pure gold, okay? Then make the seven lamps and set them on it so that they light the space in front of it. All right, now, the almond tree, buds, blossoms, and fruit are God's chosen design feature of the menorah. We need to ask ourselves, why? What is it about the almond tree, specifically almond trees in Israel, that God wants us to take notice of and understand? Well, it turns out a lot. Note that if I do a search for the word almond, it appears nine times. Interestingly, almond appears six times in the book of Exodus. Interesting. The Exodus, the the, and there are 40 chapters in the book of Exodus, which is interesting because as it would, you know, the Jews were in the desert for 40 years, you know, uh, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And it's the story of their wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. There's a lot of information to learn in Exodus about God's plan for not only the Jews, but mankind in general. And the Exodus is, is really the, the rescue of the Jews from captivity, the bondage of slavery, in Egypt, which is a picture of the world and our, you know, our captivity, our bondage and, and slavery to sin, okay? And we need to be rescued from that. So, and the rapture is a big part of that, all right? So the Jews kind of, it's like they got their rapture already in Exodus, and it was a supernatural exit, rescue, supernatural rescue with big, gigantic divine events going on, the Shekinah glory, the cloud, the fire, the you know, the parting of the Red Sea, all these things were like just big supernatural events. And the rapture will also be likewise a big supernatural event. Now, we see here that um, it appears nine times. Now, you'll notice here, I have two translations selected among all the translations available in, in um, Life Bible. I have the New International Version and the Strong's Concordance K on uh, tied into KJV. That's the KJV S. Strong's Concordance tied in. So if you're wondering what KJVS is, it's Strong's Concordance on the KJV. Now you'll notice that in Genesis 30, 37, this is the first mention of almond in the Bible. It is only showing up in the NIV here. So if I go to KJV, it says hazel. I marked it there in red because it's that's a bad translation. So the, even the KJV translation is not always super accurate. But when I click on that word hazel, you'll see here H3869, lose. And guess what? It's almond, almond tree, almond wood. Okay. That's important. Notice the transliterated word lose. That's the word light in Spanish. Keep that interesting detail tucked in the back of your mind there because um, the menorah is all about, well, light. And we're dealing with almonds and almond trees and almond branches and fruit and everything. Okay. So that's really interesting. So I'm going to go back uh, to my search results here, and we can see a pattern starts to emerge here. Um, you'll notice that in Exodus 25, 33, almond is mentioned twice. You'll notice in the very next verse, verse 34 in Exodus 25, it's mentioned once. Now this pattern repeats, but using slightly different language in Exodus 37. Notice in Exodus 37, 19, that the word almond appears twice. Then notice in the following verse, verse 20, it appears once. Interesting. So the key takeaway for me is that almond 
is mentioned six times in the book of Exodus, the book that describes the supernatural rescue of the Israelites from Egypt. Now, the law first mentioned is going to apply in this study because uh, we need to understand what God reveals to us about almonds the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. So we're going to look at Genesis 30, 37. And let's take a look at the insights that we get there and the significance to see how this ties into the menorah. Okay. Now, Jacob is working for Laban at this time. And notice what it says here in verse 37. Jacob, however, took fresh cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees. Now, if we go to the KJV, we will see here again. And Jacob took him rods, that's the branches, of green poplar and of almond and chestnut tree. Now, if we click on rods, by the way, we see here rod, staff, wand for guiding, okay? And for germinating. Isn't that interesting? A shoot, a stick for germinating. It's also a walking staff. It's for striking and guiding. Very interesting. Keep that in mind because this all plays into the menorah. Let's go back to the NIV because it just reads easier. So he cuts these almond branches, okay? And then he peels back the bark, exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Verse 38, then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. Flocks, guys, like flocks of lambs and sheep, us, like us, okay? When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches. The branches of what? The almond tree. And they bore young that were streaked, speckled, or spotted. Jacob set apart the young flock by themselves, but made the rest face the streaked and dark-colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus, he made separate flocks for himself. Jacob made separate flocks for himself. Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. Okay, But if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong went to Jacob. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks. And then you can see there the animals, okay? Male and female. All right. So do you understand that in the law of first mention here, we get a very strong picture that the almond tree, the almond branches have to do with germinating with pollinating, with growing a strong flock. The almond branch has a clear role in procreation, in generating new life, okay? That's what Jesus does, okay? He is a shepherd and he is germinating. The process of germinating, like giving us the Holy Spirit, that is like germinating us, okay? So that we can procreate, so that we can go out and help grow the flock and make more Christians. Are you seeing that? Okay, that's what all of this portends. So the menorah was meant to be a stylized representation of the almond tree itself. The menorah is a tree, make no mistake. And there's even implication in the scriptures that the almond tree may trace its representation to the tree of life. That's fascinating. Now, really quick here, let's um, read a little bit about the almond tree in Israel. Okay, first, let's look at this article here. The blooming almond tree. Towards the end of every January or beginning of February, as the winter months and their sense of hibernation have lingered for what seems like much too long, the almond trees give us a spark of joy. Their blooming flowers signal that the season is on the precipice of change. Are you seeing that? Guys, that's where we are right now. The almond trees are blossoming right now, signaling the season is on the precipice of change. Almond trees love mild, wet winters and hot, dry summers. That is a characteristic of central Israel. So you can find many almond trees even along the roads to Jerusalem. Okay, whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The city of peace, Jerusalem, the foundation of peace, where everything God likes springs forth from, leading up to that place, 
that very small place on the face of the earth that God chose to be his birthplace of everything good, the roads leading into Jerusalem are, are lined with many almond trees. Interesting. Hmm. Are you guys seeing how important this is? The limbs of the almond trees bud and blossom beautiful flowers of pink and white. It is quite a sight. And these bright lights announce to anyone looking to keep watch because spring is coming. Guys, these bright lights announce to anyone looking to keep watch because spring is coming. Interesting that the author likens these almond blossoms to bright lights because these blossoms in the context of the surrounding desert-like terrain in the wintertime where there just isn't a lot of growth and a lot of stuff budding and blooming and blossoming and green and things, it's very kind of dry and dead in the middle of winter um, and barren, I would say, desolate looking, that these blossoms in the context of that ambiance are like bright lights. Very interesting. Because almond trees bloom early, but their fruit comes late, they are excellent harbingers of changing seasons. They're also harbingers of changing lives, which we'll see as we go through the study. Their delicate flowers are the first signs of spring. Meanwhile, the nuts, the fruit seed, are ripe for harvest at the very end of summer. So now we are talking about the fall feasts. We're talking about the September, October time frame, God's fall feasts. That's when the fruit is ready. So the first sign of anything growing, any kind of springtime and stuff coming is with the almond tree, but its fruit comes at the very end. Fascinating. Okay, the Lord created our lives to have seasons, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's look at what it says here. From November to February, the almond tree is bare and is in hibernation. After the wet period and cold spells have receded, buds can be observed, attesting to the awakening that pre presages the flowering or prefaces the flowering. The flowering of the almond tree starts in early February and peaks in March. At that time, the orchards are covered in glorious pink-white blossoms. Walking through the orchards in this season is to experience nature in all its glory. After the flowering, the trees develop leafy foliage and then turn green. The almond tree is pollinated by bees. Only pollinated flowers bear the almond fruit. Again, only pollinated flowers bear the almond fruit fruit. Most varieties are not self-pollinating, so that a commercial almond orchard needs pollinating varieties nearby. The fruit emerges, emerges from March and begins to grow, reaching its maximum size in June. At that stage, the heat intensifies in the months of July and August. The fruit ripens fully. The droop splits open, and the orchard prepares for the harvest. The harvesting involves mechanized shaking of the trees, and over the years, the industry has developed and added innovative mechanism methods that preserve the um, properties of the almond fruit to the maximum extent. Following the harvest, this is interesting, the almonds are subjected to a week, that's seven days, of natural drying and are then transferred to the cracking center. Okay, Cracking centers provide the following services. Cleaning the fruit of all the orchard residues, stripping, cracking, and sorting of the almonds. That's really interesting. That seven-day thing is really interesting. It's kind of like when the rapture happens and then you get your, your glorified body. Is there a seven-day waiting period? Is there, an, is there an analogy? Is this metaphorical for that? What's going on with the almond harvest? It's interesting to think about that. Now, the droop, I have a picture of the droop so you can see what that looks like. The almond is not a nut. It is a seed, by the way. It is a seed. So there's a good picture of it as it's uh, kind of near the, you know, nearing the end of summer there. And you can see that the seed 
uh, the seed is kind of inside that thing there called the droop, all right? And you can see it splitting open. Here it is a little bit earlier when it's green. And there it is as it's starting to dry out. And then that's what's collected. That's what's harvested off the tree. And then it needs to be cleaned up so that the seed is accessible. And that's the edible part of the almond, okay? So um, let's... And I, you know, I also wanted to show you this. This is the one of the most ancient, earliest drawings or depictions of the menorah. You can see the menorah here. Now look what's right next to the menorah. We see an almond tree. And we see almonds, droops, forming on the branches there. And what else do we see? We see a little bird right on top of one of those droops on the top of the almond tree. We even see a shofar down there as well. So that's one of the oldest depictions of the menorah, okay? There's a whole bunch of old depictions here um, that are interesting. We don't have time to get through all those, but this part is really interesting, okay? That little tree there with the bird on it. We're gonna get to that later. Okay, now, um, the usage of the menorah in the first temple, the purpose of it, right? Um, in the tent of meeting, right, during the, the Moses Levitical times, okay? So according to, if we go back to the Bible here and we go to Leviticus 24, and it's interesting that we're in 2024 and we're talking about all these things here in chapter 24, we can see here in verses two through four, command the Israelites to bring you, uh, to bring you clear oil of pressed olives, that's pure oil, for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning continually. Outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant law in the tent of meeting, Aaron is to tend the lamps before the Lord from evening till morning continually. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord must be tended to continually. Okay. So that's interesting because, um, first of all, olive oil in scripture, which is what's used to light the, the, uh, the, the lamps here, are analogous to the Holy Spirit, okay? And we even see this in Matthew 25 with the parable of the 10 virgins, okay? Let's just go there really quick, Matthew 25, okay? And they have oil to keep their lamps burning, Okay, now at midnight, so it's nighttime now, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, here he comes. So five of the virgins, the wise ones, they had oil in their lamps. They had the Holy Spirit. The other five, they were also virgins. That's commendable, they were virgins, but they did not have oil in their lamps. So their lamps were going out. See, that's a picture of fake Christians or Christians that they're, they're, they're doing works. They're trying to earn their salvation by works or something. And it's kind of superficial, but they're not sealed with the Holy Spirit. There's something that they've missed in the process of getting broken first and surrendering to God and getting baptized and going through that process to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you have that gift, there's no doubt. If your dad were to give you a gift on your birthday as a kid and you un, you open it and see the gift, there's no doubt that you've received this gift from your father, right? It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. God doesn't leave any ambiguity for wondering or doubting, did I get this gift or did I not get this gift? If you have a doubt about that, you probably don't have the Holy Spirit. And that's a fearful place to be in. So you definitely want to see what you missed and, and work on surrendering to God. You got to get broken and you got to repent and you got to get baptized and you got to get that gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that is the oil, the olive oil that we see here, all right? So um, so that's what happens is to these five uh, foolish uh, virgins is that now they can't go into the wedding feast, which is happening at nighttime, and they're, they're locked out. The door gets shut, they're locked out, and they're in the street in the dark, in outer darkness, right? The same outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. We're going to look at this as well. Okay. Now, um, if we, if we back up here to Leviticus 24, you have to see here that Aaron is, is tending to these lamps continually. Now, Aaron is the, is the high priest. He's the priest here. Okay. So he is kind of a picture of the high priest, our high priest, Jesus Christ. 
Okay, so just as Jesus Christ, the high priest, in the order of Melchizedek, our eternal high priest, tends to the seven churches continually. Aaron does that with the lampstand here, the seven lights, okay? So um, remember, when we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, it's like having oil in our lamp that keeps it burning and Jesus plays a major role in tending to his lamps continually. That's you and I once we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, did you also know that the word almond derives from the Greek word amygdala, which is why the almond-shaped structures in the brain are called amygdalae. The amygdala in the brain is a critical component of the brain's limbic system responsible for behavior, emotional control, learning, and most importantly, fear. The amygdala is the central part of the brain where fear comes from. Okay, and fear happens to be one of the seven spirits of God. Now, fear is really important. Really quick, let's take a look at Psalm 111, verse 10. Psalm 111, uh, right here, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. This is also repeated in Proverbs 9.10. Let's go to Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Okay? Isn't that interesting? Now, we can see the seven spirits of God listed out in Isaiah 11.2. Now, most people know that the Bible declares that there are seven spirits of God. We see that throughout the Bible. If we just do a search here for seven spirits, we can see it four times here. We see it in Revelation 1, 4, 3, 1, 4, 5, and 5, 6, the seven spirits of God. These seven spirits of God are, are, are represented by the menorah, okay? But did you know that the seven spirits of God are actually listed out in scripture? And most people don't know this, but let's go to Isaiah 11.2 and let's see what those seven spirits of God are. Now, here's the really fascinating thing, you guys. You didn't notice it earlier because I didn't bring it up, but Psalm... Um, Psalm 110, sorry, a 111 verse 10 has four ones. You have the 111 right there and then you have another one in verse 10. So you have 1111. You have four ones. That can be 2222, okay, 1111 or 22. There is a 22 pattern in Psalm 111, verse 10. This pattern is going to persist throughout this study as we look at these different verses, okay? And I didn't pick them out because of the numbers. I just noticed this after the fact. So let's go back to Isaiah 11, 1, okay? And notice we have 11 here again, 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit, shoot, stump, roots, branch, and then fruit, okay? We're talking about the menorah here. Notice in verse two, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord in verse three there, see that? Fear of the Lord. Let's look at the KJV. Okay, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay, we're talking about the menorah, the almond tree, the rod, the branch that has to do with growth. Okay, are you seeing that? And the spirit of the Lord, that is the center shaft or rod of the menorah, okay? It is the center shaft. In fact, we see here, right there, 
This is a great image showing this. The center shaft is the Lord. We also have four almond buds on that shaft, which is super important because number four is the number associated with Jesus Christ because that's when he showed up on day four in the timeline, 4,000 years into the timeline. This is why Lazarus was dead for four days and he waited four days to raise him. And then he just declares, I am the resurrection, okay? It's 4,000 years into the time frame. Day four, I'm here now. I'm the resurrection, okay? We see that new life that Jesus brings four days in. We see that represented with the four buds on the center shaft. That's why it's so important in the instructions God gives in Exodus about how this menorah is going to be designed, that it has those four buds, those four knops on the center shaft, okay? Okay. Then we can also see here the fear of the Lord. These are the seven spirits of God represented on the menorah. Are you seeing that? Okay. And the fear of the Lord, this is a big deal because this is the first step in obtaining understanding and wisdom and counsel from the Lord and knowledge and might, okay, to be strong in the Lord. All right. So there's a lot going on here. Now, there is a mirrored symmetrical correlation of Isaiah 11.1 1 with Jeremiah 1.11, okay? And this correlates the rod and branch growth concept displayed in the menorah. Here is Jeremiah 1.11 in the KJV. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. We need to go there, guys. Let's go to Jeremiah 111 right now. This is astonishing. This is just absolutely fascinating. Okay. Verse 11. Moreover, again, do you see, do you see the 11 connection? And, the, and again, the, the numbers of the, there are 22 of these knops, okay, these buds, these almond buds on the menorah, 11 times two. Are you guys seeing this? Okay. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod. Okay, again, there's that staff, scepter, apparently to germinate. Are you seeing that? Okay. I see a rod of an almond tree. And I'm going to just switch over to the NIV now because it's a little bit easier to read. It reads pretty well here. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly. For I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Interesting. He's watching. What did we hear a minute ago about the almond trees and everything? It's about watching. Okay. It's all about watching. And the Lord is watching to see that his word is fulfilled. Because remember the branch, the shoot, the, the offshoot, the branch of Jesse, that's Jesus Christ we're talking about here. Okay. It's Jesus Christ. So the center rod of the menorah is Jesus Christ. Okay. Remember, He's the vine, we're the branches, okay? Now, you got to understand here, the context in Jeremiah is that it's written to the people of Israel over a lengthy time span from 627 to 587 BC. It admonishes the Jews for their adultery, turning away from God, turning to false gods, praying and burning incense to Baal. Punishment for their unfaithfulness takes place between 597 to 538 BC during the Babylonian exile. Okay. Now the exodus from Egypt was long before this. That was around 1446 BC. All right. And then the Roman empire rule over Israel came long after this, right? That was like 63 BC to around 313 CE plus. Okay. So, um, so this is, this is well before, well before Jesus Christ arrives on the scene but God is saying something fascinating here in verse 12 because he's saying he's watching to see that his word is fulfilled in terms of Jesus Christ coming on the scene and he's giving a hint to the menorah. He's giving a hint to it because he shows Jeremiah the branch of the almond tree. Okay, so the story of the first mention, right, in Genesis with Jacob and the flocks and all that is tied into this and everything. So this menorah is very important to God because he's bringing it up, okay? Okay. He's bringing it up and showing it to Jeremiah here. Okay, now notice here, um, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting toward us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. 
guess what that's a, a, a future prophetic vision of? The Babylonian exile that's about to happen, okay? That's what it's important because the Babylonians came in, they invaded from the north and then, and then they took over, okay? So while this may have happened in the past with Babylon invading and conquering Israel from the north, okay, before Christ's time in 597 BCE, it will happen again with the Roman Empire, okay, coming in, and again in the end times with Russia, Turkey, and the other countries that gather against Israel in the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, okay? Remember Ecclesiastes 1.9, what has been done will be done again. And there is nothing new under the sun, okay? It was already here long ago. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. So sad. So um, we can see here in Ezekiel 38, we're not gonna get into the detail here, but you can see here uh, in verse six, and Gomer also with his, all his troops, like all these troops, like these nations, it's like all their troops and Beth to Garmer from the far north with all its troops, you see? So that repeats, all right? So we, we're, we're talking about end times as well here, all right? It, it had meaning for the Jews at this time, but it also has meaning for us today, all right? Um, okay, so what do we wanna look at now? So key, key takeaways, right, on the menorah and the almond trees in Israel are timing. The almond tree is the earliest to bloom in Israel. First tree to bloom in Israel, okay, is the almond tree. The blossoming of the almond tree typically also, and very interestingly, it coincides with Tu B'Shavat, the feast of trees, which literally means the new year for trees because it's the first tree to blossom. Got it? In 2024, Tu B'Shavat was January 25th per Hebcal and Google if you just search for it, Okay. Um, it's January 27th, which is today on the Torah calendar, and it's February 2nd per the Zadok calendar. Now let, let's watch a quick video from Hannah Nesher talking about the almond tree in Israel, okay, during Tuba Shavat. That's like right now, right? Let's watch that. Shalom, this is Hannah Nesher uh, coming to you from the land of Israel, from Voice for Israel Ministries. We're here in the beautiful land of Israel and it's still the winter, but we have these beautiful trees. You see behind me the almond tree, which is already blossoming. These are the first trees to blossom, the first signs of spring, to say spring is on the way. And there's a really interesting Hebrew word play that we see in the, in the book of Jeremiah that you don't see it in the English. So I just wanted to share this with you because you know um, on this we have a special day in Israel to celebrate the trees because you know for so long thousands of years this land lay completely desolate. It's also really important to mention here that trees in the Bible are symbolic of peoples and palm trees are like Christians. Remember they were waving palms on Palm Sunday. Those were people that believed in Jesus Christ the Messiah. Those are Christians. Okay, there are all different kinds of trees in scripture and they represent different kinds of peoples and groups. And the prophet Jeremiah said that God said people will come through this land and say, why is it so desolate? Uh, there's nobody here, there's nothing here. And God would say, it's because of my anger, because of the sin of the people. It says they followed the dictates of their own heart. So, you know, we can't just, you know, it's like follow your own heart. We cannot follow the dictates of our own heart. We have to follow the voice of God and the word of God, spirit and truth. And so, for so long, this land, nothing would grow here. It was desolate. And now it's just so amazing. All these trees in the land. So we have a special day called Tu Bishvat, which is the festival of trees, just to honor and to celebrate the beautiful trees that we have here in the land. It's Tet Vav Bishvat in the month of Shvat. Uh, that's the 15th of the month of Shvat. And so here we are, Israel just celebrated Tu Bishvat and especially this is a time when these almond trees start to blossom. So Jeremiah in chapter one, verse 11 and 12, God said to Jeremiah, what do you see? What do you see? And Jeremiah said, well, um, I see the branch of an almond tree. So in Hebrew, the almond tree is a sheked, sheked, sheen, kuf, 
dull it. And then God said, that's right, Jeremiah, you've seen very well. Because I shaked, I anishaked, which means I watch over my word to perform it. God is watching over his word. And so they were using a really kind of cool wordplay in Hebrew over the shaked tree, and the, the, which is the almond tree, and the God uh, says, I, I, I shoked over my word. I watch over my word. And in Ezekiel chapter 12, 25, God says, Ani Yehovah, I am yud hey vav hey. I am Yehovah God. I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. And I have a word for you here. Because I think some of us, we know God's word. We've been standing on his promises, but it's like, what? Uh, it's just been so long. Nothing's happened. I don't know if it'll ever happen and we get discouraged. So I want to encourage you here, all right? Because in Psalm 105 verse 18, it says, Joseph was sold as a slave and he was put into irons. He was hurt until the time that his word came to pass. So there is a proper time. God has a proper time for his word to come to pass in our lives. So there can be this delay. We get excited at the beginning and we're excited at the end when it comes to pass, but there's this middle that you have to go through. We all have to go through it, but at the proper time, God will bring his word. He's watching over. Remember the almond tree. He's watching over his word and he will perform it. And let's just be encouraged. This land lay dormant for 2,000 years and now it's absolutely gorgeous. All right? So God can bring life back into our lives too. So look at the almond tree, the shkidia, the shaked, and be encouraged that God is faithful to watch over his word. He will perform it in your life and in mine and in this beautiful land of Israel. So shalom uh, from the land of Israel. Okay, so we can see uh, right there that the almond tree is the first tree to bloom in Israel. It's associated with, in a very big way, the Feast of Trees, Tuba Shabbat. And it is all about the changing of the seasons, the coming of springtime, the first fruits harvest, which is coming, that's next, guys, and the approach of Passover. So this almond menorah thing even makes me wonder if the crowds praising Jesus on Palm Sunday, if they understood from the menorah the season that they were in and to be watching, to be watchful for important events rapidly approaching during the spring Passover season. Remember that um, the, the first fruits, okay, they are associated with the spring feasts, right? Um, so we have, we have figs, we have the barley harvest, okay? These are coming at the time of Passover and the first three spring feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits all happen in Nisan and in rapid succession, okay? That's coming. That's next, guys. It's coming up real quick here, okay? Now, I, I believe that we are first fruits. The, the folks that are raptured are first fruits. The barley harvest is the most representative thing of first fruits because, let's see, I want to pull up an image here. Uh, where is it? Right here. Okay. I put this chart together here to show the months, the Hebrew months. Okay. And then some weather and then the crops and activity for those months. Okay. And by the way, this almond thing, it's like first and last, you know, alpha and omega, because it's like the first thing, it's the first sign of anything coming in the springtime. And then it's the last, you know, one of the last fruits to be harvested, right? So isn't that interesting, right? That the alpha and omega, the, the beginning and the end are kind of built in to the symbolism in the almond, in the almond tree, okay? But um, we see here that... Um, in Nisan, right there, first month, March and April, that's the barley harvest beginning, okay? And it's also the first spring figs, okay? And by the second month, IR, April, May, the barley harvest is completed, okay? Now, and then the wheat harvest begins. That's the dry season, the wheat harvest, okay? Remember, there's gonna be um, a thirst for hearing the word of God. The word of God is gonna be gone, um, and I think that's because the barley is gone, right? It's going to be a dry season, 
where there's gonna be a famine of hearing the word of God. And that's because the church is going to be gone. And then that's when the, the wheat harvest, the wheat stuff begins. Now, now wheat, you gotta understand, wheat is like the main harvest, but, but I think these are people, wheat represents people that are gonna be going through the tribulation and wheat has chaff that's more difficult to be removed. And in ancient Israel, the chaff was removed by throwing, um, throwing down wheat into a circular, I think I have a picture of this in my thing here. Yep. Okay, so wheat gets thrown down onto the, fleshing, the threshing floor. There it is. There's a threshing floor in Israel. You can see a couple examples here of these stone threshing floors. So you'd throw the wheat down on that, and then you would get a tribulum. Okay, a tribulum is a board, right, with a bunch of like either stone or metal kind of knobs or spikes built into it. A lot of times they would be sharp. And that would be placed down on the um, floor of the threshing floor, and then it would be dragged along with like ropes and chains and whatever over the wheat, to remove the chaff. This was a painful process, okay? This was like, it took a lot of work, but imagine if you're a, a head of wheat and you're alive sitting down there on that threshing floor when that tribulum comes over you, that's gotta be quite uncomfortable, violent even, okay? Did you also know there are two wheat harvests? Not only does Israel have winter and spring wheat, okay? But they also have winter and spring barley, oats, and rye, okay? Winter wheat is sown in the fall and then harvested in the spring about two weeks after the barley harvest, the winter barley harvest, okay? Then the spring wheat is sown in the spring and then harvested in the summer about four months later. And this is the harvest found in scripture for the Pentecost wheat, okay? Now, the other interesting thing is and why I think we're part of the barley harvest is because the barley would be winnowed, okay? Let's see if there's a picture of this winnowing barley. And there, you know, they would typically they would grab a sheet. They could grab if they wanted to do a lot of it, four people can get on a corner, you know, a square sheet, four corners of a sheet. Okay. And they could throw it, toss it in the air. We see different examples of, of it being tossed in the air here with the winnowing. And they have these like winnowing forks and they're kind of like just shovels kind of like tossing it in the air. See that? But you could put a whole bunch of it on a sheet and you could toss it in the air. And then the, 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 the gentle winds blowing would actually blow the chaff off of the barley. So it's a more gentle process. It happens in the wind. The wind, like the Ruach, the Ruach HaKodesh, right? The, the breath of God, Okay blows on that barley, that first fruit, and knocks the chaff off. So it's, a, it's much less difficult than going through the tribulation, the tribulum in the wheat harvest. Got it? Okay. So um, we could talk about trees and everything else, but I, I, I don't think we really have time to do that now. Um, let's see. I want to look at Okay, back to the almond tree, right? And, or the almond and the menorah and how it relates to the church, specifically the seven churches and the rapture and the end times, okay? So really quick, let's go back to the Bible and I just wanna uh, quickly go over to um, Revelation 1, okay? And we're just gonna go all the way down here and we're gonna look right here and we have confirmation. We get confirmations here about the menorah and what it represents, okay? Uh, Revelation 1, verse 19, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So again, the seven churches are, whoa, Okay, the seven churches are represented in the menorah. We have a confirmation there in Revelation about this. So there are multiple things that the menorah is representing. Now, let's go to Ecclesiastes 12.4. All right. Um, and let's go to the KJV here. 
okay? This is, this is just so important, guys. This is just so important, okay? Verse four, and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. He shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Notice he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. That's interesting. Now look at verse five. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fears shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish and the grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets. Oh my gosh, guys, what does this all mean? Well, let's, I want to pull up an image here first, this image. This is one of the oldest depicted images of the menorah. And look what's right next to it. We see the almond tree with the almond fruit, the droops coming in. And we see a little bird up there, don't we? We see a little bird, okay? And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird in verse four. And then in verse five, we see the almond tree flourishing. How fascinating. I, this image makes me wonder right here, if the artist was inspired by the Ecclesiastes 12, four and five verses and its connection to both the menorah and the season. All of this menorah stuff ultimately leads us into Revelation where we see confirmation of what we've been talking about and additional clues to the rapture, its timing and the tribulation, okay? Now, I wanna go back um, to, well, before we do that, let's, let, we have to cruise through Ecclesiastes 12 because there's so much here, guys. Okay, so verse two, another timing clue is here. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, that word is low in the Hebrew, not, nor the clouds return after the rain. This is super important. This is a huge timing clue because it specifically states with absolute clarity that the sun, moon, and stars not be darkened. So what that means is that we're talking about a period of time before Matthew 24, 29 and before Revelation 6, 12. So here's Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Okay, that seems to describe kind of a solar eclipse while the stars are falling, I'm not sure. Okay, okay, now, after the seven seals are opened, right? The seven trumpets are blown by seven angels and trumpet number four is the sun, moon, and stars being darkened. Trumpet number five is the opening of the bottomless pit and the locusts being released to torment those on earth. Ecclesiastes 12 talks about this, guys. Okay? And <laughs> it's just astonishing. I mean, it's just... It's unbelievable. We're gonna look at this. Revelation 8, 12, and the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise, okay? So whether we're dealing with the incident here in Matthew 24 or the incident here at the fourth angel, um, in Revelation 8, 12 and the sun, moon, and stars being darkened, okay, these events here in Ecclesiastes 12 happen before the sun and the moon are going dark, okay? And I believe this is another hint to the timing of the rapture happening before the seals are opened, okay? In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, okay? And so what this is referring to, this is, reminds me of the beginning of COVID, which really was a shadow of what's to come, which I think is gonna be this whole disease X thing, okay? And the great American solar eclipse marks an X, and that happens, happens during Passover on April 8th, 2024, okay? Could this mark the beginning of this disease X, the launch of this you know, new kind of pandemic thing? 
And it's interesting that Twitter is X and changed their name to X and there's SpaceX and, you know, both owned by Elon, which is interesting, right? Um, and so then we have the doors and let's see, this is Matthew. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, the doors are shut. Okay, if we look at the, this, this whole thing right here in verse four, the doors will be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. The grinding just refers to like working in general, like economy and workers going to work and stuff, okay? Um, and people being trapped in their homes here in verse three, at the end of verse three, and looking out of their windows. And this word right here for darkened is like, like your hopes are shattered. It's like literally shattered, darkened, you know? Your hopes are dimmed right? Broken. Okay. That's what that, that's what that's referring to. Right. And so I think this disease X thing is going to be much, much worse than COVID. COVID was a small shadow of what was to come, what is to come with disease X. Okay. And the timing could be around Passover during the great American solar eclipse around that time. Okay. Now the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. So it tells us when the doors are gonna be shut. And this harkens to Matthew 25 in the parable of the 10 virgins when the door was shut and the, the other five virgins are now trapped outside in the street at night in darkness, okay? And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, okay? Now, this is really interesting because we're we're talking about I think this is portraying the rapture. I think it is, okay? And um, all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Now, in in COVID days, you know, when we look at these words here, daughters, it's just young women, okay? And then music, you know, singing and, and so forth. Religious song, notice the song of Levitical choirs, religious song. When COVID started, churches were shut down. So music was stilled, it was quieted. Okay, now it's back now because we go, we can go to church on Sunday and we hear all the singing. But, and I don't think this is just referring to religious song, okay? But I think, you know, it could refer to just all singing is gonna be kind of stilled. And this next pandemic is gonna silence a lot of it. There's just not gonna be a lot of joy and live performances and concerts and singing at church, especially not at church. If the rapture happens first, and all the singing that we do on Sundays at churches is gonna be silenced, it's gonna be stilled, it's gonna be brought low, okay? Verse five, also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, this is like haughty, arrogant, okay? So we're kind of talking about like the Klaus Schwabi Schwab folks of the world and the WEF folks and the WHO folks and all that. Fears equals the word terrors, okay? So the almond tree is represented in the menorah again and the budding and the fruit bearing of the almond tree in Israel represents specific time frames. Okay. So we see that here with the almond tree flourishing. The word flourish means bloom. Okay. So we're given a specific time frame. Uh, and it's all ties back to the menorah with the almond tree and the buds and the blossoms and the blooming and the fruits at the top. Okay. And then the grasshopper, this word here is actually locust. Okay. Okay, and the locust shall be a burden and desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home. Because man goeth to his long home. What is a long home? This is an eternal dwelling, continuous existence, perpetual, everlasting, indefinite, eternity. This is an eternal home. If we look at the word home, it's house, dwelling, shelter, abode of light, Okay, containing a family, household. Okay, so we're literally, I think we're, we're talking about the eternal home. A man is going to, Adam is going to this eternal home. Okay, those saved believers are going to go in the rapture. Then what, what happens immediately after that? Uh, see, desire fails, right? The locusts come, Desire fails. This is desire is like man's plans, their plans for the future, that job, that buying that house, that car, that upcoming vacation, whatever. All these desires, your plans, they've failed. They're, your dreams are shattered. Okay, so desire fails. Then the rapture happens. And then the mourners go about the streets. That's just like the parable of the 10 virgins, the five that are now out in the dark in the streets with no oil on their lamps. They're mourning and they're going about the streets in the dark. All right. 
or ever the silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be broken. So this makes me kind of wonder about the bowl judgments in Revelation 16. Okay, notice also, or the pitcher be broken, or the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. The fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. You, you, you see the pulley wheel at the top of the cistern was used to draw water up from the cistern or from the well, but now that pulley wheel is broken that holds the rope for the bucket that goes down into the well. It's broken. So the living water is no longer available when the bold judgments are poured out and only the terror of judgment remains, okay? So all the saving of people is gonna happen kind of before that. And then whoever's left, it's like, wow, harsh judgment coming, right? Okay, the living water is just really not available, okay? Um, and then we see here in Revelation 16, uh, the loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels to go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath. Okay, and there are the seven angels pouring out the wrath, all right? All right, so um, this takes us into Revelation now, guys. These events are all discussed in Revelation. Again, um, even the, right here, the locusts, okay, right here. You see the grasshopper? The almond tree shall flourish, and then what happens after that? We, we're dealing with locusts being a burden. Okay, what happens there? Where is that in Revelation? That's right here in Revelation 9, verses 1 through 3. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on earth and were given power like that of the scorpions of the earth. Okay? So this, this just puts us right into Revelation. Let's go to Revelation. Okay? The menorah, just it's just all over scripture. This almond tree thing and the branches and the menorah and the, the timing of it, that are the timing clues given in the menorah are just all over scripture. It's just everywhere. Now, Revelation 119 is amazing. Revelation's a unique book in that it gives us a divine outline of the book, whereby Revelation is segmented into three parts, okay? So I'm gonna just switch over to NIV really quick here, and we're gonna look at Revelation 119 here real quick, okay? So write these things, which in Revelation 119, it states, write these things which thou hast seen, that's past, the things which are, that's present, and the things which shall be hereafter, that's future. So Revelation provides for itself a divine outline that breaks Revelation into three segments. Segment one, write the things which thou hast seen. This is the vision, the vision of Christ, okay? Which Christ had already come and gone, right? That's, that's chapter one in Revelation. Segment two, the things which are, the seven churches, those are right now. They are current. They were current when John saw the vision and they are still current right now. That's chapters two and three. Segment three, and the chain and the things which shall be hereafter, okay? That's the word hereafter is metatauta, okay? That's super important in the Greek, metatauta. What follows after the churches? That's chapters four, yeah, you could say five through 22, Okay. All right, now, the amazing thing about this is that when we look at Revelation, okay, we see the letters to the seven churches, okay? And, and, and so we're dealing with the, the things that are, okay? All right? And then, so we're talking about the seven churches, all right? Now, look what happens right here. We get this transition at the end of Revelation 3, okay? Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. On my throne? We're talking about the throne room now, which is also talked about in Revelation. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, 
Revelation 4, we transition immediately to the throne room in heaven. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. We're talking about the rapture here. And the voice I... Um, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. After this, metatauta, the church disappears here in four, chapter four, we see that. And then we see what appears in, in uh, verse four here, the 24 elders, okay, and, the, and seated on the, on the 24 thrones there in God's throne room, dressed in white, that's linen, and had crowns of gold on their heads, okay? Now, this is interesting because when Daniel talks about this same scene, you know, he doesn't see the 24 elders, okay? But John does. And John's given the outline of, of past, present, future, okay? From the throne came flashes of, you know, rumblings, peals of thunder, etc. In front of the throne... Okay, this is super important, guys. In front of the throne, in yellow there, seven lamps were blazing. Guys, that's the seven churches that were just talked about. Revelation 1 confirms that the menorah is representative of the seven churches, the lampstand representing the seven churches. And now, here in Revelation 4, in front of the throne are the seven lamps burning. Okay? It's like the menorah. The menorah is a picture of, is an earthly picture of something going on in heaven that we see right here. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal, okay? And then again, the 24 elders fall down and they worship and they sing a new song and they cry out, you are worthy, O, o Lord, or God, to receive glory and honor and power. Now, in verse five, we transition further. Who's, how, how does the tribulation now kick off, okay? Well, the seals have to get opened, okay? Then the trumpets, then the bowl judgments. Now, it's unclear uh, whether these things are gonna happen consecutively. They may not. Some of these things may overlap. In fact, they may all happen at the same time, meaning when seal one is opened, you know, does trumpet one happen at the same time? We don't know. That's unclear, Okay. And hopefully we're not going to be around to find out. But who's worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? Well, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the root. Remember that center shaft, okay, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking at it as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures. Okay. The lamb had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Guys, the church is has the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit resides within you. And we we are members of one of those seven churches. All of us, every one of us that's a Christian that has the Holy Spirit is a member of one of the seven churches listed in the first couple chapters of Revelation, okay? Those seven churches carry with it the Spirit of God, the seven spirits of God, depending on which church you're in, okay? So you contain one of those spirits, all right? And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp they were holding, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. This is why I say in the beginning of all my videos, guys, I look forward to waving palms and singing songs with you. It's this new song I'm really looking forward to. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons, that's us, from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's Jews and Gentiles alike. God has purchased us and we're there we're there with him when this happens you you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our god and they will reign on the earth remember aaron was a priest and it was his staff that was an almond branch that basically blossomed and and uh bloomed and and had the almond fruit the actual almonds came from it okay he was a priest and he's tied to the almond tree. We are too, because we're the churches and the, the almond tree is represented, represents the churches through the menorah, okay? 
Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels. And we don't have to read any more, but, but you, you see where this goes, okay? You see where this goes. So um, this is all very astonishing. It's all very astonishing. I hope you got a lot out of this. And I do believe that we're right there, guys. We see it depicted in the artwork. We see it depicted in the actual menorah. We see it depicted in the agricultural uh, information, okay? We just see it everywhere. It's just all over scripture. So I hope this has been educational. I can't wait to meet you all. Um, stay close to God, stay in prayer, stay in his word daily, um, stay in the fight. And uh, I look forward to waving palms and singing a new song with you all very, very soon. This could be the season, guys, 2024 and this coming Passover. Passover is my favorite time for the rapture because that's, what the, that's when the exodus from Egypt happened, which is a picture of our exodus, our exit, our fleeing from this world of sin and, and captivity and sin and slavery um, in the flesh and um, going to the promised land. So I hope to see you there soon. Maranatha. See you on the next one.